I, I, I do think that to say, to, to give the women's movement uh, to white women is not historically accurate, you know, to give the second wave to it. Because in my experience, the women of the National Welfare Rights Organization, uh, you know, many individual women were in the leadership of the women's movement always. So, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think women of color have been pushing back and challenging. But I mean, to suggest that it was that it was always just sort of about this clear sisterhood that didn't have all of these anxieties would, I mean, would ignore again sort of the best historiographies out there, as well as kind of the personal stories of women who were part of mm -hmm. SNCC, the Black Panther Party. Um, now, again, not that black women are not a big part of thinking about reproductive rights, about thinking about voting rights, but it's also been true that thinking about those issues has often required. Asyl in the same ways, by the way, the civil rights movement has often asked African American women to silence their gendered um, positions in order to be in solidarity with the race. I'm just suggesting that if maybe if we look through the prism of black women's experience and not just try to use black women's experience as a kind of, you know, look at how much harder it is for women, but instead to really try to understand that intersectional experience, mm -hmm. I think we'd come to a clearer perspective. Well, I wasn't making Barack Obama into an, a European American person. I was assuming that he would be in this hypothetical, which is a lead into an article to, you know. Uh, well, let me ask you know, that. That obviously he he would be at this intersection. He would be both a female human being and an African American human being, and con to consider that. Let me ask you the question about war and peace. I mean, the earliest community in this country, uh, population, African Americans, um, with the largest group uh, who are opposed to the war from the very beginning, mm -hmm. and also iced out of the corporate media. Do you think that plays a big role here? I wanted to play this clip of mm -hmm. uh, Senator Clinton. Um, she voted for the war in Iraq mm -hmm. in 2002. This is some of what she said on the Senate floor at that mm -hmm. time. So it is with conviction that I support this resolution as being in the best interests of our nation. And it is a vote that says clearly to Saddam Hussein, this is your last chance. Disarm or be disarmed. Now I'll play a short exchange about Senator Clinton's Iraq vote uh, on, in yesterday, Sunday morning's interview with Tim Russert on Meet the Press. It is absolutely unfair to say that uh, the vote, as Chuck Hagel, who was one of the architects of the resolution, has said, was a vote for war. It was a vote to use the threat of force against Saddam Hussein, who never did anything without being made so to do the, so. The title of the act was the Authorization for Use of Military Force Against Iraq but Resolution. If, that was Tim Russert questioning, uh, questioning Hillary Clinton. Your response, Gloria. Well, she said, arm or be disarmed. I mean, this is a conundrum. I utterly disagree with her vote, 100 percent disagree with her vote. I, uh, if we had been in that position, being shown all this false information and so on, I don't exactly know how we would have voted, but I certainly disagree with her vote. And that issue playing in here in the uh, race between Obama and Clinton, mm. that Obama came out early opposed to war. Yeah, I, th I think that that's a great advantage for uh, Obama, in fact. I, he wasn't being asked to vote under the same circumstances. And in some sense, we need to compare votes that took place under the same circumstances in the time in which they overlapped on the Senate, in the Senate. But he was speaking out, and that's very important. And it's, you know, part of the reason that all this time when people said to me, are you supporting Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, I always said yes. <laughs> Melissa harris Lacewell, you were in New Hampshire. Um, we spoke to you right before the vote came in. At that time, the polls were saying Barack Obama was going to win. Um, your thoughts now? Well, I, not only was I in New Hampshire, I was also in Illinois. I taught at the University of Chicago for years before coming to Princeton. So Barack Obama was my state senator. He was my U.S. senator. So every time I hear people say he doesn't have much experience, I find it extremely irritating because it means that somehow representing me in my government meant um, very little experience. Um, so I actually was there in Chicago and in Illinois when Senator Obama took those um, stands against the war. And I can tell you, it was not an easy thing to do. Um, so I'm, a, I'm a 
appreciative of having been represented um, by someone like him who had those, those kinds of positions. I mean, what happened in New Hampshire? Clearly, Barack Obama brought in the percentage in the polls that he was expected to bring in. But a whole new group of voters showed up to vote for Hillary Clinton. It doesn't look as though Barack Obama's um, uh, poll voters actually abandoned him. It looked as though they actually came and sincerely voted their interests, which I think is a great sign for the capacity of this campaign to move forward. But there was a whole new group of voters, mostly um, women of Hillary Clinton's own generation, white women of Hillary Clinton's own generation, who did show up at the polls and vote, cast a vote for Hillary Clinton. And that's what put her over the top. Um, and I do believe that much of that had to do with this intersection of race and gender. The ways in which Hillary Clinton became discernible, understandable, and recognizable to these voters in her moment of anxiety and stress, in a way that Barack Obama, as an African American man, remains alien to many white women. In other words, it's just very difficult for them to see themselves in him. But again, 36 percent of that vote who claimed that they were going to vote for Barack did, in fact, show up and do so. So I think it's, it's, it's good news for the Obama campaign, although it does continue to indicate the ways in which white women's particular race and gender position can be of major benefit to them when running against an African-American man. Your response? Well, are, are, are white women being racist when they vote for Hillary Clinton? Um, I don't know. We'd have to look into the heart of every person who's voting. That's not what voting. I said. All right, good. But uh, yeah, I, 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 in fact, I've, I've regularly said that I don't think that naked racism explains this. He could not have gotten the kind of support that he got in New Hampshire. Um, again, I, I, what I'm suggesting, and, and this goes against this question of complexity, mm -hmm. is that our understanding and expectation of who white women are and how we respond to their suffering is quite different historically than how we respond to the suffering, anxiety, and stress of African-American mm -hmm. men and women. So the people who said they were going to vote for Barack Obama apparently voted for him, that 36 percent. But a whole new group felt motivated to come out and vote for Hillary Clinton, and that seems to be related to her particular sort of performance um, on the Monday before the election. And that does seem to me to be indicated in questions of race and gender without saying that these people are naked mm -hmm. racist. I'm incredibly impressed by the voters of New Hampshire who take very seriously the trust in which the rest of us as citizens put into them to make a decision because so often we are disfranchised from the process because the early primary system allows just a few voters to make these critical choices. And over and over again, the people of New Hampshire were very serious in how they were trying to gather information and make decisions. I would not disparage them by claiming they are racist. I would, however, say they're part of the American historical system that responds to white women's suffering in very particular ways, and it cannot see African-American suffering in the same ways. I wanted to ask you, uh, Professor Lacewell, I spoke to you on Jesse Jackson's show on Keep Hope Alive um, when you were in New Hampshire. Uh, and afterwards, I spoke with Reverend Jackson um, about why, although he's supporting Obama, he's not out on the campaign trail for him. It was, of course, right before the New Hampshire primary. We were in New York. And he said, basically, um, that Obama was keeping him at arm's length, and he yep. was respecting that. Your thoughts? Well, again, there's a long Chicago history that goes way back here with these two gentlemen and sort of uh, their relationship to Chicago politics. And we have to remember that as, as being just sort of the strategy of politics in general. But the other part of it is there's no question that um, the Obama campaign has run as much as possible a non-racialized campaign. They are not running for president of black America. They are running for the president of the United States of America. And they, I think, have a recognition from David Axelrod on down the ways in which race can be polarizing. I mean, I'm very glad that Ms. Steinem got such positive responses to her op-ed piece. I wrote a, a piece which, um, on, which hit Slate, in which I sort of made the similar arguments I uh, made here, and I received death threats to myself, to my daughter. I was called a racist, um, even though I spend most of my hours, um, you know, working with uh, privileged white uh, students who I love and adore and work very hard for here at Princeton. So it's, I, I have to say that the ways in which race, the moment it shows up, explodes campaigns is part of why uh, the Obama race has sort of kept race at an arm's distance. And so many of us who are supporters but not part of the campaign are the ones who end up bringing up race because the campaign itself does not do so.